So without much further ado, we'll go ahead and let Dr. Morrison take the yeah, you're ready. Um, let me turn on my mic. Can you hear me? Okay. If you can't hear, just raise your hands. About uh, three years ago, I had pneumonia, which left me with partially paralyzed vocal cords. So I don't have a strong voice, but I'm very passionate about my topic. So feel free to raise your hand or let me know that you can't hear. In addition, can you hear me? Okay. In addition, as you can see, we're videotaping. So uh, those of you in this area, if you don't want to be on the videotape, you may want to go over there. Uh, you'll be asked to sign permission forms uh, so that we can uh, use this video. Okay. We're here today to talk about dyslexia. Um, let me just, in fact, let me go over here and use this book for a minute. Um, I want to put dyslexia into perspective for you. There's a very interesting article by Goff and Tunberg. It's called A Simple View of Reading. And I think they put this whole Perspective. Okay. They define reading as decoding times linguistic comprehension. Now they they have changed linguistic to language comprehension, and the times up here is very critical. If you have one plus zero, what do you have? One. If you have one times zero. What do you have? Zero. Zero. So do you see how important this times is? If you have decoding without comprehension, that's not reading. If you have comprehension without decoding, that's also not reading. And uh, so we will help us. So they drew a, a simple diagram. This is high, this is low, this is decoding, and this is linguistic comprehension. Dyslexia fits here. If you have someone who struggles to decode, oh, thank you, who struggles to decode, uh, okay. If you have someone who struggles to decode but appears to be fairly bright, competent, this is dyslexia. If you have someone who struggles with decoding and with comprehension, this is what we call a garden variety struggling reader. That's actually the term that's used in research. They call it garden variety struggling reader, low decoder and low comprehender. These are often kids who have not been exposed to books or who just for some reason or another would rather play video games than get involved with books. It's not necessarily a socioeconomic uh, status here, but it can. Now, uh, we have this group too, who are low comprehenders but high decoders. And these kids, put this here, these kids are hyperlexic. And in my experience, these are the hardest kids to teach. These kids can decode, they can decode anything you give them, but they don't comprehend what they mean. And often because they can decode, teachers are fooled. And often because dyslexics have such good comprehension and can make smart comments in class, teachers don't believe they have a reading disability. Now, there's not a lot known about this particular group, but the teaching methodology for these three groups has to be different. These kids require heavy emphasis on comprehension, a language-rich intervention or teaching, whereas these kids have the language skills and the comprehension skills. They required multi-sensory structured language intervention. 
So teachers have to be able to teach to all possible types in their class. And then, of course, you have the, um, that's what I'm you have the kids who do it all well, who are going to learn no matter what you do. So with this background, because this particular group of dyslexics have been so, um, I'm not sure where that came from, thanks. Uh, they, they tend to be ignored in school because they are bright. Most of them are average or above average intelligence. Uh, they learn coping skills. They do very well. But there does come a point if they're not identified when they hit a wall. And this wall can occur um, in Carly's case at ninth grade. We've had other students who hit the wall in 11th grade. Often it's younger than that, it's fourth or fifth grade, where the reading load tends to become so heavy that they just cannot keep up. So whether you're early childhood or middle childhood, whether you're math, PE major, music major, it doesn't matter. You still, by, uh, by mandate now from the Ohio Board of Regents, have to understand dyslexia and how to spot it in the classroom and how to refer those kids to get the help that they need. Plus, you should have enough tools in your kid to know how to adapt instruction for those kids. Okay, you good so far? This, this legislation is very recent. It was passed in 2011, December, and I think it becomes in full effect in 2014. So if you get a teacher's license anywhere in the state of Ohio, uh, the next year or after, you have to demonstrate awareness of dyslexia. And I think you also should be able to discriminate the particular kind of reading problem that the kids are having. All reading is for me, okay? But, I mean, obviously there's no reason to read if you can't <laughs> understand it. But these kids need to be taught the structure of language. These kids don't. These kids need to be taught both the structure of language and how to comprehend. These kids may need some comprehension strategies, or they just may need some compensation. OK. Now, do any of you have actual experience with dyslexia? You erase that. Sorry, it came so she can use it. Thanks. Any of you have friends, family? Yes. Can you tell us? I'm dyslexic. You're dyslexic? Great. Can you tell us what it's like? What your struggles been like? Um, mine's mostly like when I'm writing, I'll, like there's certain words every single time I will spell wrong, no matter how many times. Like I'll spell um, first wrong all the time and else, and I just an answer. I'll split my letters every single time. Okay. Um, like when I'm reading. Some, to somebody, I'll flip everything out loud so I don't like reading out loud. But my comprehension's really good. It's just the you internal fit, part. You don't you? Comprehension's really high, but she struggles with letters. Now, about 14% of the kids with dyslexia fit this uh, pattern where the letters reverse. Most of them uh, have a problem that's in their brains that's not as visible as the switching letters. And that is they have trouble connecting the letters and sounds in their head. Let me pull up a couple of the videos here. Uh, just show you briefly what we're talking about. Sarah, what time is class over? I'm sorry. <coughs> what time is class over? Uh, 10 55. Okay. I just want it. So that's yeah, my no, 55. No, 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 no. featured, well, not yet, I guess that's the second one, but go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, thanks. 
Okay. Did you have trouble at school? Me? Yeah. When were you diagnosed? Uh, eighth grade, ninth grade. Eighth grade, ninth grade. Okay. How did you get that far without being diagnosed? My mom would sit and do homework with me every single night and make me do it. And she kind of just like, it's like you don't need to be, you just can do it. So at that point, you discovered that yeah. you didn't need her, you needed something? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, we have to get past the ads here. Did you know that in spite of having access to tap water, the United States is the world's largest bottled water consumer? First time a child is sitting in class and suddenly discovers that he or she can't do what everybody around them is doing. I had a terrible time reading. My teacher's school couldn't understand it. Uh, I thought I was a bright student, but I simply could not read. I always felt a little bit different going through school. I remember even at an early age having anxiety. I was never the one who would volunteer to read out loud or give a speech or go to a speech class. You measure yourself against other children. And when you can't read nearly as well as your classmates, it is something that is very disturbing. I knew as a kid there were a lot of things that were different just about how my mind seemed to work. But you know, when you're seven or eight, you just think you're a leader. I wanted to talk to the principal and I asked him, am I dumb? Is this not the right place for me? I discovered my youngest son and I shared the same problem. And he was then in second grade and I was about 40. I was 34 years old, uh, and I was dating a teacher, and I was trying to read the paper, and I was having great difficulty reading because I don't read well. And she finally said, you're dyslexic. Dyslexia is what's called a hidden disability. So you don't see any signs. The children seem to be and are bright in every other way. What happens is, on the page, there's so many words, and then there, it's black and white, so everything's just swirling around, and I can hardly keep track. I see a bunch of foreign code, and so I have to go through each word to decode it and turn it into sound in your mind. And then, of course, that gives meaning. The definition of dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading in comparison to their intelligence, level of education, or their professional status. Dyslexia is difficulty learning to read and the inability to read quickly. Difficulties in spelling. Difficulty with handwriting. But the basic core problems involve reading and getting to the sounds of words. When children are young, they associate reading with intelligence. And reading is simply one way that we accumulate information. It is not anything to do with how we process that. How we process that information is far more important the kind of person we are, the kind of contribution we make, the kind of utility we have for society. When I saw Sky and how depressed she was and how she thought she was dumb and she didn't believe in herself, I just thought I was losing her. You know, the discovery of dyslexia for a student and for their family is a journey. It begins usually with a caring teacher who says something like, think I see a problem, and directs the parent to, to assess it. The truth is, parents can catch a lot of things, but you really don't know it until you're in school, because this, the teacher can watch you progress on a daily basis. And if someone you discover may be dyslexic, you go, oh, okay, you and I, we got a journey. What we now know is you can be quite intelligent and still be very slowly. And in fact, is if you look at the top tier of any profession, writers, people in cinema, physicians, Nobel laureates, attorneys, people in business and finance, there's a disproportionately high number of people who are dyslexic. People who are dyslexic are not going to be your sequential, very literal thinkers. They're going to be the out-of-the-box thinkers. It was only four years ago that I was diagnosed with having childhood and adult dyslexia. When I found this out, I was shocked. But when it was really proven to me that I actually had suffered from this my entire life, I was so relieved because all those years of terror 
standing up and reciting and going to the blackboard and spelling things. It was incredible the amount of relief I felt. And then I got angry. You know, why did I have to spend so many years not knowing about myself? Why couldn't somebody have brought my parents and I into the fold of knowledge uh, uh, back when they could have done something about it? One of the things that is unfortunate with children in public schools is that because you have one teacher trying to organize a classroom with 35 students, you might even realize that that student is probably dyslexic. That student might also be dyslexic. But you simply, in the course of your day, are not able to give them the accommodations that they need. And I think there's nothing more heartbreaking than that. The biggest. Okay. I'm going to stop this here because that gives you an idea. The woman who was speaking, Dr. Shaywitz, is the woman. Uh, she is the medical doctor who is on the National Reading Panel. And she is a specialist in pediatric neurology. She's a professor at Yale University, and she's the one who's done brain scans that have helped us in the last 15, 20 years uh, firmly identify dyslexia and what the characteristics are. So uh, there's a, another little piece with her on it that shows some of the brain work that she's done, so I'm going to show that, <coughs> then I'll introduce Carly. Sarah, I think. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, do any of you have any questions, comments? Any of the rest of you have friends or relatives who are dyslexic? Um, I have a close friend who's dyslexic, and he always spells my name wrong, which I didn't know he was dyslexic for a really long time. And like, he would be on my Facebook page, and my name is like right there, and he'd always spell it like. Stephanie instead of Stephanie, and I was like, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. So, but he's like really smart, just like. Exactly, exactly. And this is the, uh, the tragedy of this. Uh, in the public schools in Ohio and elsewhere across the nation, although there are some states that are slightly better at this, in, 19, in the 1980s, I think it was 85, uh, Texas. More than two years ago, law, the people of BP. And we'll get past the app. Texas had a law. Uh, well, being a lawyer to me means. To identify, yeah, home, to identify dyslexia and to treat it, not necessarily to go into special ed. In fact, their procedure is to first identify the student, give them a 504 plan, and then decide if they have other. Uh, problems that would necessitate special ed, because special ed is not always the place with these kids. Um, they should stay in the classroom. They learn so much by listening uh, that they absolutely should not be taken into an environment where less is expected of them. So that means the classroom teachers have to kind of uh, learn how to accommodate, not how to be an interventionist, but at least how to accommodate them. Okay, let's watch this for now. Richard the shapes. No, I don't think it's Richard Grimes. It's not the one. You absolutely Do you want to come and help us? <laughs> First time. <laughs> Dyslexia is very common. It affects one in five people and impacts both spoken and written language. Our next guest says this dyslexia is a paradox because most people who have it are both very smart yet read slowly. In her upcoming book, Overcoming Dyslexia, Dr. Sally Shaywitz shines its clarifying light on the symptoms and the treatment for dyslexia. Dr. Sally Shaywitz joins me now. How are you? How are you? How are you? Nice to see you. Now, when did the book come out? 
It came out a, little, a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. Okay, so now how's, uh, what's the reception to the book been like? Oh, it's been fabulous. Um, the hardcover came out first, and then it's in its 18th printing, uh -huh. and the paperback is now in its 14th printing. And um, people say, this is about me. Now I understand. You've helped me, uh, as nothing else has, because dyslexia is very common, but it's a hidden disability. Mm -hmm. So, so many people think they know, but they don't, and science has made extraordinary progress and the idea behind my book behind our Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity is to shine a light on that scientific progress so it can benefit people who are dyslexic. Now you say that dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading. Now what do you mean by that? An unexpected difficulty? Yeah. In well in our society we assume if you're very smart you're going to be a very good reader and if you're a very good reader you must be very smart. Mm -hmm. And that's true if you're not dyslexic. Mm -hmm. But in the case of dyslexia, you can be very smart, very motivated, try really hard, but you can't read, particularly can't read quickly and automatically. Mm -hmm. So it's unexpected in relation to the person's age, intelligence, grade level, and professional status. Now let's talk about some of the very famous people who are yeah. dyslexic. Well, there are, um, for example, Carol Breider, Dr. Carol Breider. Mm -hmm. She won the Nobel Prize in Medicine just this past December. Mm -hmm. She's very dyslexic. And what's so interesting about Dr. Breider is that she had trouble getting into graduate school. She was rejected from 12 of 14 graduate programs, not because she wasn't smart, but only because she couldn't finish her GRE. So she scored poorly. And people took that as, as a measure of her ability. But two schools, uh, University of California at Berkeley mm -hmm. and Caltech, had the good sense to go further and accepted her. And you know what? She did her Nobel Prize winning work there. Oh my gosh. David Boys, uh, we've all heard in the news today that the ban on gay marriage mm -hmm. in California was overturned. Well, one of the two attorneys who argued that was David Boys probably the most uh, renowned attorney in America, he's dyslexic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Stuart Udofsky, mm -hmm. who's chair of psychiatry at Baylor and has written 30 books or edited, he's very dyslexic. Now tell us a little bit about what's going on with the brain when, when people have dyslexia. Okay, um, well we've been very, very fortunate because there's been a new technology called Functional Magnetic Resonance Imager. Mm -hmm. If any of the people uh, watching have ever had an MRI, it's like that, but smarter. Mm -hmm. So you can ask someone to read and see what's happening in the brain. And so I think um, right what people are seeing mm -hmm. is on the left is the left side of the brain. Mm -hmm. And you can see there are three areas that are highlighted. One in the front of the brain, that's mm -hmm. the green, and two in the back. So when a typical reader reads, those three areas become activated, mm -hmm. they're working. When a dyslexic person reads, the area in the front becomes super activated, the green. But take a look, those two areas in the back mm -hmm. are not activated. And what's important, especially that area in yellow, is yeah. called the word form area. And that area is the area that allows people to read automatically. You know, when it's a pleasure, you see the word, mm -hmm. you don't need to think about it because it's automatic. Now tell us how it also affects the spoken word, the spoken yeah. language. Well, what people uh, may not be aware of is that reading is based on the foundation of spoken language. Mm -hmm. So the primary difficulty really is hearing the individual sounds in spoken language. Mm -hmm. So people who are dyslexic hear them fuzzily, or they're not as clear and as crisp. So, for example, somebody's put on the spot on a test, tell me the five reasons. Right. They may have explained it to their peers mm -hmm. and know it really well. But when it comes time to pull out the right word, they go, mm, -hmm. uh, or they may say a word that sounds like it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. A little girl was in school, mm -hmm. and her teacher showed her a picture of a volcano. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said to her, what's this? And she says, it's a tornado. Oh. And the teacher said, well, did you know what a tornado, a volcano is? And once she heard it, she said, of course. Oh, this it's a mountain with a big yeah. hole. So she knows it, but mm -hmm. if you rely on her ability to read it quickly, mm -hmm. or to say it mm -hmm. quickly, you're going to mistakenly think she can't, when she can, and this little girl is dyslexic. Wow. How about the Sea of Strength model? Explain ah, that to us. Okay. Well, the Sea of Strength grew out of our increased understanding of what dyslexia is all about. 
And what it is, it's not only a reading problem. It's a whole way of thinking, a good way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So what we have developed. I think we have a, a shot of the CS Sprints model. Can we bring that up on the screen? There we go. Thank yeah. you. So the way uh, we conceptualize the sea of strengths, and that's um, discussed in my book, Overcoming Dyslexia, is there's an encapsulated weakness so that the person reads slowly. Neurobiologically, they can't help it. Their brain is wired that way. But at the same time, those, that weakness is surrounded by a sea of strengths in higher level thinking and, and reasoning. So, for example, reasoning, concept formation, creative thinking, problem solving, critical thinking, all these higher level skills, people who are dyslexic have them to an extraordinary degree. We never measure them in school. So, so the goal is to identify the weakness, yep. identify the strengths, mm -hmm. but remediate the weakness, mm -hmm. but make sure the person who's dyslexic okay. can access those strengths. And you do that most commonly by understanding, one, that spoken language is going to be full of glitches mm -hmm. and causes, and also by providing accommodations on tests. That is, people who are dyslexic, because the way their yep. brains work, they can't help it. Mm -hmm. No matter small They might need a little more time to they test. They need extra time. Other. Right. And uh, it's, go ahead. Excuse me, I, I just really wanted, uh, wanted to... I'm going to stop this here. There's just a 30-second clip that I want to show you. It's an animation, but I think it'll give you a, a very clear idea of uh, how these brains work. And as you've already heard, okay, go to the uh, It'll let you see how a dyslexic <laughs> struggles to make sense of this. Um, and it's, it's kind of glitzy, but I think it puts it kind of across. Jeff Kelly Meat from A. Jeff Kelly Meat. Hey, hey, stop! We're trying to figure out when we can get together to work on our class project. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> was dyslexic last October, and it was right before I went to a conference in Baltimore where Sally Shavitz, a professor from Yale, was the speaker. And after her speech, I went up to her and I said, I have a student who has such a disconnect between letters and sounds that she has assigned numbers to the letters, and then she assigns the sounds to the numbers 
and that's how she figures things out. And I said, what would you advise that I do? And she just looked at me and she said, I've never heard of such a thing. So Carly and I have been on an adventure to discover what works for her and uh, what doesn't work for her, and she can talk more about that. So do you want to just start? So I found out I was dyslexic this year, and I kind of knew for a while that I was. And like the video said, like, it's probably like the saddest thing trying to grow up being dyslexic because you do think you're really dumb. It's, it sucks. <laughs> Are you dumb? No, I guess not. I've been told I'm not. <laughs> well, she had straight A's through junior high, one A minus. When she got to high school, she was placed in honors courses, and she still carries uh, close to an A minus average now, even with the dyslexia and all the problems. So trust me, she's a smart kid. <laughs> <laughs> so like growing up, what like goes through your head is like you it's true you see those people in class like reading so fast and you're just like oh I wish I could do that I feel so smart so you beat yourself down a lot so now I have Dorothy telling me oh I missed 12.8 I'm so smart I got this and you really have to boost your confidence up like I still don't have the confidence I should about it but do you want to I'm tell me on what it. the 12.8 is? Oh, Let so me see if I can, here, sure. I can pull this up. <laughs> These are Carly's tests. Uh, let me just explain this a little bit. <coughs> she, uh, you have to be below 85 in this column to qualify for services in schools. She has one score that's below 85. Everything else shows that she's a very average kid. And this 12.8, this was taken when she was in uh, the second month of the ninth grade. This 12.8 is her listening comprehension. So if I were to read to her and ask her questions, she could handle material at a 12.8 grade level, which is C, which is three grade levels above. Yes? How many? How many of the categories does she need to fall below that 85? Just that's one? A, that's, a, that's a good question. It depends on the category. In this case, if you look at the fluency rate up here, it's below the first percentile. And uh, Carly, why don't you explain to them the system that you developed to read, and then I'll come back and answer your question. So when you were little and Started to realize that she didn't read oh. the way everybody else did. Can I draw on the Sure. Floor? Okay. So I don't know why any of this is how it is, so it's kind of confusing to me. But like, if I read the word um, land, I can't sound it out on my own. Well, now I can because I know visual phonics, which helps. But what I have to do to find like the sound of each letter I have to assign a number to it so like A would be one so A was one N is the 14th letter in the alphabet so it's 14 D is fourth in the alphabet and L is 12th so I only have one sound for every letter so L would be U depending on the day A is either A or A, a and then N N and D D so it could either be land or land. If I had a good day, it was land, and I could figure it out. But then after I sound it out, it takes me like 20 seconds if I don't have, well now I'm learning sign language to help me process words faster. But um, it would take me like 20 seconds to figure out what the word meant. So I think the number was like the average kid could read uh, 250 words per minute and I read 15, so I'm a little less. <laughs> yeah, so because of her fluency, because of this very long process, Carly got accommodations. She has a 504 in place, and uh, she's getting accommodations. Let me show you this. This was the spelling test that we gave her as part of the assessment that we did. You can see the numbers up above the letters. 
And these are uh, non-words, they're pseudo-words. That this, that she did very well, as you can see on her scores. Given enough time, this system works for her. She got good comprehension, she got, uh, you know, good scores, but she was absolutely miserable. Uh, you go ahead and talk you know, about what your experience was with dyslexia. How was it discovered? Okay, so. First of all, this test is the worst thing ever. It took me three hours of sitting in a room and trying to like, I was exhausted by the end of it. It was a nice nap when I got home. <laughs> but um, I got to ninth grade and I was really frustrated because it was like 4.0s through middle school, easy getting through, didn't read any of the books, listen to class discussions, and I could write an essay on it. But um, I got there and we had to read uh, Beowulf on our own and that book's killer and <laughs> I just talked to my teacher one day and I was just like I can't really read that well could you help me out or something and he brought a special ed teacher down and she said you should probably get this checked out so lucky enough we're family friends with Dr. Morrison and I got the test pretty quick and this came out that I was pretty dyslexic. <laughs> but um, the thing that was kind of frustrating about it, and since you guys are like future teachers, my teacher came and he honestly didn't think I was telling the truth about dyslexia. Like he told my parents he thought I was lying. And that's really hard because when you finally come out and you're like, I can't read and everyone else can, <laughs> like I should be able to. And having someone doubt you so hard, that's like the worst thing ever. Because that's what I was most afraid of. Like I have four super smart brothers and I'm not that smart. Well, in reading, I'm not as fast. <laughs> but um, so I was just scared to admit that I couldn't do it. So finally, he did admit to my parents, like, he was sorry that he said it. But just, like, whenever kids come to you and they tell you something like that, just, like, with all your heart, try to believe them, as weird as it might be. They're probably telling you the truth. And if they're not, you can deal with that later. But just like hope they're telling the truth because they probably are. Okay. How did you get that far? Um, um, how did you fake your way? And even with your parents, who as you said, your four older brothers are very high achievers. This is a family that values education. How did you how did you fake it for so long with your teachers and with your parents? Um well, every night, like, I would get done around 7, 8 with my homework, and then I would just watch TV shows with my mom and dad. And then I would go up to my room around 10, because that's, like, my bedtime. And um, I would do my homework till 3 a.m. in the morning, and that got really, really rough, because I have a church class now that starts at 6, and then I would get, like, on average three hours of sleep, and it finally caught up with me. So that was one way I just had my homework done with. I got through that. Like one worksheet would take me about an hour a piece, except math, that was fast because it's just numbers. And um, then also, you know in elementary school how you have the reading tests? My teachers had three books and they would let us choose out of them. So I would sit by the door because I'd always be next and whoever was in front of me, I'd listen to what book they chose and then I could hear what they said, memorize it and then just look at the page act like I was reading and say it. So that's how I got through the reading tests. Um, OAAs and stuff, they have the simple words to the crosses out, what, who, when, where, cross those out. So you have the keywords. For the reading sections, you just take the keywords and look back and um, see where they use that word. And then they usually have passages like when he did this, what was the consequence? So you take that part and then it'll just match up with one of the answers. So that's how I got through that part. Essays, um, we would usually have to read books. We would either read them in class or talk about them and discuss them. I would just write my essay on whatever we discussed the most. And then um, for, I'm trying to think what else we did. Oh, for study guides, my teachers were pretty nice with that. They'd pretty much have the same answers, just in different forms on the study guide that were on the test. So if I just memorized, like, I would set up number patterns. So once I translate it into numbers, 
I would see that number pattern in my head, and then once I saw it on the test, I could just be like, oh, that equals this. And then that number pattern would be like C or something. So. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can't be dumb and figure out this system. It's the most elaborate system I've ever seen. And apparently the most elaborate that uh, Sally Shavitz had ever heard of as well. Um, do you guys have questions for Carly? I want to leave plenty of time for her to answer questions. Um, but right now in our class we're learning how to do um, assessments, um, like reading assessments with kids. And I'm just wondering, like, were you given like running record? Like, did you did your teachers do like running records with you? Like, that's when you like read out loud and you know you have to they mark what you say. Like, did you have to do that when you were younger? Like, this was probably a long time ago, but I'm just trying to think how you would get through that. Like, yeah, they usually took us out in the hall, like I said before, so I could just listen. Um, one nice thing would be is just to switch up books. Don't let them have a choice, which probably isn't their preferable thing, but, you know, it forces you to take out those kids who might be dyslexic. Also, for those, if you go, when we go in circles or something, um, I would just read ahead and decode it so I could say it. I might say a couple words, but if I say it out loud, then I can figure out how it's supposed to sound. Also, if you talk enough in class, your teacher gets really annoyed with you and won't ask you to read. So it's just like, oh, this is the obnoxious kid who just keeps answering my questions. So that's one way I got out of reading. <laughs> um, how old were you when you came up with this system? Um, I came up with a system in fifth or sixth grade because in third grade I was still reading like the same book I started in first grade and then in eighth grade I actually finished my first chapter book, one of the little magic treehouse books by myself. Did any of your teachers ever know about your number system? Like did you write it on tests and they were like, hey Carly, what is this? Or you no. just never wrote it down anywhere? I would usually like write it on my hand so if I would just remember like you can like I don't know I could always feel what I had written if it was like a little short word or something. Gotcha. So they didn't ever ask. Okay. I was just wondering. Yeah. So like, what did what did like what did you reading and what would it look like? Do the oh, letters or like? Yeah. So right now I have two sessions a week with Dr. Morrison for an hour, and then I have two sign language, which is helping me get to comprehension, and then. Once a week on Tuesdays, I have visual eye therapy at OSU because words flip. I can do it. If yeah. Carly, if you heard uh, Charles Schwab on the tape, he said as soon as he got to the sound, he could figure out what the word was. But well, we thought that would solve it for Carly. She got to the sound in two sessions. She picked up visual phonics so fast that uh, she was able to break the sound code. And then I was stunned when she turned to me and said, when are we going to talk about what these words mean? And I thought, wait, if I say them, you get it, but if you say them, you don't. And that's exactly the process. We're, we still are not quite sure exactly why that's the case, but we're trying to work through it. <coughs> Carly needs a visual and a kinesthetic cue to get to the meaning. Just the sound of the letter alone is not enough. So if you want to show them, one day we have the word land. Oh, okay, I'll do two things. So first for land, that's what I would do when I used to. But to find the meaning, I would always have to think of the last time I heard it. So I would write out the word like on my table or something, like on the back of my hand. Um, and then I thought, this was last week when we did this, I think. I, uh, the last time I heard it was in Mr. Stott's class when we were reading the book Beowulf. And I saw the word land on line 1,296. It was like the seventh word in the row. And then it would be like grass or something. And that's how I get to it. And now what I do is to like sound out a word. I have visual phonics. So L is U, A, N, D, and that's how I sound out words. And then for meaning, 
I'm like making up my own version of sign language with a tutor. So the sign for land is that. So that's just how I'm getting to word processing. So I think of when she did it, and if I see her and we talked about it, then I get to the meaning faster. And then what happens is it kind of, with dyslexia, one thing that's really scary about it is for me, since words flip and stuff, I'll have a good day where I'm not tired and it might look like this, but my eyes like unfocus and that's what we're working on. But um, if I let my eyes unfocus on a word, sorry, I have to take a look at it. it um, Can look like that. So I have to blink a couple of times because my left eye is kind of weak or something. I don't, I'm not sure. But it, um, if I blink, it will, my eyes don't like to turn in. So it will bounce back from that. And it takes me a while to sound it out. But it's hard when things look like that to get to the right sounds. Questions? About this process. Okay. You can see what an amazing memory she has. Uh, I wish I'd brought the sight wood cards that we use because I laid them out. You usually go one by one to work with sight words, and she picked them up so fast that I start to lay them out with 12s, uh, 12 cards here, and she would go through them. And then I would gather them up, shuffle them, and present them to her randomly. And do you want to, is there any way you can show them what you do? Um, like she would just line out. We would have like 15 cards. Right. I think the most we did was 20 at a time. But she goes through it and she'll say, I point to it, she'll say it, and then we'll maybe do like a little sign for it, like want or something. And um, then we go through with each one. And if I don't know what it means, she tells me what it means. And then what, what happened at first, when she didn't know, I could just like sound them out really quickly. She would just say, OK, now you read them. And I would zoom through it, because I'd memorize what she had said, because I heard it. She, just to put this in perspective, she could go through these uh, 240 words a minute after she had heard them one time. She memorized them and just went like that. And, and then what she did since I got smart with that, she would take them away. I mean, I got smart with that. <laughs> <laughs> she would take them away and shuffle them and show them at different times. So then I came up with, I would memorize where it was on the table. So if I just pointed there, then I would see it in my head. And I'd be like, oh, that's want. OK. So pretty amazing memory. Any other questions for Carl? Yeah, I'm just having a little trouble understanding why it's the letters that get all jumbled and not like why numbers are so much easier. Um, I picked to put it into numbers because they all look different. And with letters like a D, you flip it, it's a B. So if I took it down just to numbers, it's a lot easier. And if they flipped, it would be faster to take apart. Yeah. Um, I've always been like, really good at math, like numbers have always, like I kind of use them to decode things too. But like when I read, that's what it looks like, like a bunch of scribbles. So I think it like, I had to get like bad things. Like you said your eyes like have trouble focusing on more, like mm -hmm. you really have to struggle. I like went to the doc, like the eye doctor and like, did you get like glasses or something? Because that helps a little bit to get, to yeah. help like strengthen my eye vision to like really help you like focus on the words easier so you don't have to carry it like had to spend more time like trying to focus on the word and then try to decode it. So maybe mm -hmm. if like your vision, like if glasses have helped you like focus it right away, yeah, and like see the word how it is, then it would like skip that whole part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would happen? I went and got my eyes checked, and it was like a small prescription, so it was nothing really to get filled. Mm -hmm. So then I got a visual tracking test, which is for this and. Well, when I, first when I went to the eye doctor, they put all those numbers, all the letters up on the board, and it was just like blurry mess and everything looked like that. So they thought I was like blind or something because <laughs> it, was, it was bad. But when they singled it out, it'd take me a minute, but I could get it. So once I did visual tracking, we have things like I have a Brock string, which is, it's a really long string that I tie to my doorknob and hold out my nose, and it has little 
um, round balls on it and I just move them closer to my face and try to focus and I'm just trying to strengthen my eyes because that's what it is my eyes just when I try to focus so hard they just go everywhere like that video did and um, the other thing that we're doing is my left eye since it's weak we have I put on like these 3d glasses and I put down a paper like I'm reading and we have a translucent sheet that has green and red stripes and when one of my eyes goes um, just like stops working one of the sets turns black so I can't read anymore so I just have to go like this in front of it so then usually I just cover this eye because my left one and I read using that so it's not really a vision like my eyes are fine they just don't like focusing right yeah, yeah. so Carly how do you compensate you said you assigned each letter a number mm -hmm. But we know that there are more sounds than there are letters. CHs, different schwa sounds, many different, you know, 44 different phonemes. So how did you deal with that? And then Dr. Morrison, how are you working with her on those types of sounds? So I guess two-part question. So I was pretty much, if it wasn't the word that I sounded out, like, <coughs> I have no other way to figure it out. So it was pretty much get the word or I'm not gonna get the answer to the question. <coughs> like I, I use the example, I would uh, write down the word popsicle and if I get it wrong, it's pope cycle. And two different things in my head if I figure it out. So I pretty much had, if I didn't get the answer right, it was no hope. Like I couldn't do anything about it if I don't sound it out right. But Dr. Morrison and me, she's teaching me all the rules to if it's a soft vowel in that word or if it's a hard vowel, and that will get me to the right sound, and then I can do the sign that goes with it. But that's really helping because they do have a lot more sounds. And I <coughs> use visual phonics to, because if I don't use visual phonics and it looks like that, I don't check myself. So like the L, it's this, so I have to connect those to make sure they look alike because in my head that's how it works. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, what we tried immediately with Carly was a system called Visual Phonics, which was actually developed for deaf kids to uh, understand the phonemes of the language. And there are 44 phonemes, there are only 26 letters. So that's where she was running into trouble. And one of the very first things I started to work with her on was uh, syllable patterns, open and close syllable patterns, so she could sound out multisyllabic words. And in order to do that, she had to know that an open syllable uh, had the long vowel sound, and a closed syllable had the short vowel sound. And her comment was, what? They have two sounds? I hate this language or something like that. And I said, yes. But the hand signs are different. If you know the manual alphabet, anybody know that? A, B, C. Okay. For the long sounds, it's A, E, I, O, U, which is the manual alphabet. And then for the short vowel sounds, it's A, A, E, A, I, N, O, A, U, A. So by giving her the hand signs, she caught on to this. In fact, I taught her this, and I just taught her the vowel sounds. And she came back and she said, why don't you teach me all the rest of this? <laughs> so I did. And we went through all 44 signs. The next session, which was two days later, she came back and she had all of them but qua and yeah. what was the other one? The X. The yeah, the accent, which is really KS, when you put it together. So she picked this up. It was wonderful. I could code the words. She could read. I thought, this is great. You know, we'll just figure out how to code and uh, then fade this out and see if it'll transfer for it. And she even came out of that session and said, I love to read. Because <laughs> she could decode at a normal rate. But then she threw this clinker at me that she has to go through this process to get to the meaning. So just giving her the sound and the key to the sound was not enough for her. So we've gone to signs. 
Uh, we've also gone into morphology, which does seem to help quite a bit. As I noticed, uh, what strategy she uses as she reads, uh, we teach the Greek and Latin roots, we teach the prefixes, the suffixes, and those are phonetically regular. So it's easy for her to decode them. They're big words. Uh, they appear in the type of reading that she does, and she picked them up very quickly, and that has helped. If she talks to me, like I get everything. But if I read it, it's blank. There's nothing there. So that's why if I sound it out, I can be like, oh, I've heard this word before. I know it. Like it's that thing where it's on tip of your tongue, but you can't come to it. So that's why I have to go through this. I have to think through the whole process of when I heard it, and then I get to the meaning. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the time you're done decoding every single word, does the sentence you just read make sense and come together, or do you have to reread the sentence and then like reread the paragraph? This comprehension of problem. Um, when you say decoding, is that just like sounding it out or finding yeah, the meaning? Like sound, um, finding the meaning. Oh, so if I decode, so if I sound out and I find the meaning, I'm fine. Like I might read over it once. We do that just so it's just like I get the whole sentence fluid in. But if it's just sounding out, I have no idea. I can read it, but I just don't know what I'm saying. What, what we don't <coughs> know, if you'll go back to those brain pictures and the very fast connections that have to be made, she obviously has developed a different set of connections here. And what we're trying to do now is to establish those connections. Uh, the part of the brain that responds to hand signs and to uh, uh, kinesthetic cues is right in the middle of that process, that uh, phonology, uh, word shape meaning kind of process. It's a split second process. And so this seems to be helping her to build these bridges, but she's had, what, eight years to perfect this system that she has. So we're trying to retrain her brain. In the meantime, she has compensated beautifully. But what you have to remember about dyslexia, it's not a hearing problem, it's not a vision problem. Although in her case, there were tracking issues which we spotted. Uh, she went to a, a vision therapist and is getting therapy for that. It's a neurological issue. It's the way her brain works. It's the way her brain processes letters and sounds meaning. As a, as a, just wondering if the glasses even work at all, because I'm dumb. <laughs> That's what I was like wondering. Um, like, did your visual, like, you know how they said they do like, you went to the eye doctor yeah. and they were trying to do like visual type therapy? Does that work? Like, for your tests and stuff? Right now, I don't really use glasses. They put me on like different kinds of lenses I look through, like plus four, and it just makes my eyes tighten, which is what they don't want to do, and it hurts so bad. Like last time I played Wii with it, so they make it fun, which is cool. <laughs> but I mean, I haven't really noticed anything yet because it's only been three weeks, but hopefully it works. You know, it's just all whatever happens. I don't know if you. Um, so now that you have been like diagnosed and you're getting help, does it still make you nervous to like think about what's gonna come, like all the classes that you have to take? You know, is that still like nerve wracking for you? Um, yeah, at the beginning, I have a couple teachers who didn't really help me out. Like, they wouldn't follow my accommodations. Like, some of them is I have all my tests read to me. I can get half homework if I need it, if I'm overwhelmed. So, right now, we're reading uh, How to Kill a Mockingbird. And what I get, we have to write eight responses, and I'm only writing four because it takes me a long time to edit what I've written. So, it's kind of scary. Like, I don't know if they're going to be welcoming to the idea. Like, the best thing is to do is just 
fulfill their accommodations. Like, I have one teacher who turned tests into videos for me. Like, it would just be her saying it, or she makes podcasts over the internet of her lectures, so I can restudy that. Also, my parents have bought me assistive technology that I can use. Have you guys ever heard of Intel readers? Do you know what that is? So I just take a picture, and it reads it to me. And then I also have a EcoPen, which records class lectures, and then I can just listen to them later. Then I have drag and speak on a laptop so I can talk my essays, and then my dad just edits them. Yeah, so it is kind of scary. But. This is more directed for you. Is assisted technology allowed on like SAT, ACT? Yes, if you establish the pattern in the high school, which is what we're trying to work very hard for, for Carly, because if she can have the assistive technology for the ACT or the SAT, I think she'll do just fine. Without it, she'll be like the uh, gal who won the Nobel Prize, <coughs> who couldn't finish her GRE test. Okay. Any other questions? Um, what have teachers done that helps you? I think you mentioned a few things. Have there been things that teachers have done that have hurt you or helped you? Also, uh, I don't think you told this group that you won National Writing Awards, yeah. which is interesting, too. In seventh grade, I won a National Scholastic Writing Contest, but we had unlimited time on that, so it's not anything too special. But um, my teachers, they did, like, they've all helped me in the ways, like I told you, they make my homework easier. If I ask, they help, but one thing like you guys could do is if people have accommodations, for me, since I took so long to tell, and it was just really, like I felt stupid because I had dyslexia and couldn't read as fast as everyone else, it's scary coming up to my teachers who some that, especially the ones that didn't help me in the beginning, I mean like, I need to have you lessen this assignment because it's just always like they might say no, but like they shouldn't, but I've had it, people say no to me before, with like my teachers and stuff, so. I mean, just, if they are asking for too much, like kids, you can like lessen it to a certain degree because you don't want people taking advantage of their situation. But for me personally, like just having help and getting things lessons, like I don't want to take advantage of that because I like being able to work, like actually being able to do my homework well for the first time is really cool, which sounds dorky because I like doing my homework. <laughs> but. Yeah, so just help out the kids and be receptive to whatever they need. Okay. With the new laws, though, the teacher's not going to be able to tell her no, correct? They will have to stick to the accommodation. Yes, they do. So in 2014, if she has a 504 plan, then a teacher's not going to be able to, first of all, aren't they going to have to know that there's a plan? Right. And second of all, they'll have to, you will have to make accommodations ahead of time. You won't tell a child, no, I'm not going to do that. That's right. But the more that you can learn as, a, as an education major ahead of time will help you differentiate instruction right. and accommodate assignments. Right. Okay. Yeah. Would it be just as fair for your teacher to like give you a longer amount of time to do the assignment the same way as everyone else? Or would you prefer it to have it less than Um, I have that too. Like okay. If I turn in something like a daily or a couple days late and I've talked to them about it, they don't take points off or anything. So pretty much like that's what I, I usually go for things late because I don't like getting lesson because you know you want to learn stuff as much as everyone else does. But um, the thing that's like really important is like about the no thing like yeah they won't be allowed to say no but they might be so scary like walking up to them that you don't want to ask. Like they might, you can say it really passive or aggressively like oh, yeah, I guess I can do that, but you're going to have to do extra assignments. You're going to have to make this up. Like, I've had teachers add extra work on to me because I've asked for time. So, I mean, just don't be scary. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, I think I speak for everyone that I'm beyond impressed by, like, the methods that you've come up with. 
Um, how do you find time to fit all of your school work and fit all of the work that you're doing um, for your eyes and for the phonics? Um, how do you fit all of that into your schedule? Well, before I had accommodations, and I people even knew I had dyslexia, I didn't. There were a lot of, in eighth grade, I had a big thing with my French teacher that it was horrifying. Like, I just stopped doing my homework because I finally broke down. I was like, I give up. I can't do it. And there were just other things where she was saying I was lying about things, which I honestly was, but I kept on lying, like saying it was other things because I just didn't want to admit it. Like, I lied to my parents about it, and it's just, it, it's sad that I had to, but it wasn't a good situation at all. So, I mean, now I it's hard. I get really tired, especially after the eye therapy, like headaches. I get about three headaches a day in school, and they're, they're really bad. And I often come home and like take an hour nap, and my mom's really nice about that. She lets me take a nap. But I just have to make sure to get all my homework done, and if that interferes, a lot of, I'll go to the teachers that I'm not scared of and be like, could I have an extra day on this? and they'll help me out. Or I have another teacher who she reads my textbook to me during lunchtime when I need help. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Do you have any questions generally about dyslexia? Okay. Well, thank you, Carly. This took a lot of guts to come here and do that. Thank you very much.